used to think that the minor prophets were unimportant and uninteresting. I'm not sure that I think that anymore, but it is perhaps true to say that some minor prophets are um, more minor than others. And it's certainly true that outside of Bible students, all bar one of the minor prophets is unknown. Ask anyone, even some Christadelphians, for a synopsis of Habakkuk, or Obadiah, or Nahum, and you'll probably get a lot of blank looks. But remember Nahum, we'll be coming back to him, an example of minor prophets working together. But mention Jonah, and everyone knows, well, many people. And they will say, ah, you mean Jonah and the whale. In fact, that is probably what many people think the book in the Bible is called. It isn't the book of the prophet Jonah. It's the book of Jonah and the whale. But don't get me wrong. Any connection, any knowledge that anyone has about the Bible is a good thing. Long may Jonah's great undersea voyage be celebrated and used, God willing, as a jumping off point for further Bible study. But the plain fact is that the whole sea monster business is incidental to the main thrust of the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is all about... Well, let's leave that and get back to it in a few minutes. Because the book of Jonah, like other well-known Bible passages, has suffered from its celebrity. Some people say that it's a fantastic myth, a bit like Ezekiel chapter 1. Other people say, well, it's a play like the book of Job. And actually it is well structured. And we shall be viewing the four chapters in that way. But this is a documentary in four episodes, not a drama in four acts. More thoughtful criticism observes that the book of Jonah is not well anchored in the history of Judah and Israel. And one of the main themes of today is to answer this point. Now, none of us here perhaps doubt the historical accuracy of the book of Jonah. And whilst it may not be well anchored into the other historical accounts, it's anchored well enough. Two, preferen two references primarily, we'll look at one now. It's in the second book of Kings. Uh, 2 Kings 14 verse 25. Um, 2 Kings 14 and we'll pick it up in verse 23. 2 Kings 14, verse 23. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned forty-one years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant, Jonah the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hepher. This is a very clear reference to Jonah, not any Jonah, but the Jonah in chapter, verse one, chapter 1, verse 1 of his book. There is, of course, a much better known reference to Jonah in the New Testament, but we'll get to that later. Let us dive in, surely an appropriate metaphor for Jonah, into his book, by starting with chapter 1. <coughs> Jonah is called by the Lord to go to Nineveh, a great city of the Assyrians, and to preach against it. Jonah doesn't want to go, and our first question for today is, why doesn't he want to go? There are a number of explanations. The more complex ones basically say that Jonah was either afraid of going to Nineveh because Assyria was an enemy of Israel, or that he thought he might actually succeed in getting the Ninevites to repent, and this would be a bad thing because it would be better if Nineveh was destroyed, as it was an enemy of Israel. Uh, we're told nothing of the reason in chapter 1. We get some sort of explanation from Jonah in chapter 4, which we'll be looking at there. But I think that explanations that require a good understanding of the geopolitical situation in the Middle East at the time of Jonah, we should discount. The book of Jonah needs a simpler explanation. Jonah just didn't want to go. He was having a Moses moment. His tongue was going to stick in his mouth. He was the wrong man for the job, and he wasn't doing it. Someone else would be a better choice. I mean, there's plenty of others who enjoy a bit of missionary work. Why, Lord, do I have to go, says Jonah. Does Jonah really think that he's going to escape from God? He, he does not, but we'll see this in a moment, and he isn't trying to hide from God. He's simply trying to make it inconvenient for God to send him to Nineveh by going to the other end of the earth. And so God will have to choose another to go in his stead. 
And so Jonah looks at his atlas and he sees that Nineveh is due east and the edgemost point on his map to the west is a place called Tarshish. I'll go there, says Jonah. Take months to get there and months to get back. God will have chosen, will have sent someone else to Nineveh by then. Where is Tarshish? The Spanish coast? The Atlantic coast of Portugal? Brittany and France? Or as many Christadelphians believe, our very own Cornwall? I don't know. And for the book of Jonah, of course, it's not important. After all, he never gets there. Although, for what it's worth, the internet seems to think that Tarshish is in Spain. Uh, so that must be true. Um, but basically, what we need to know is that it was as far west as you could go. And so Jonah takes the train to his local seaport at Joppa, found the next departure to Tarshish, and here in the middle of verse 3, we have an utterly mundane phrase. He paid the fare. Jonah bought a ticket. Why does the Bible take us the trouble to tell us this rather dull fact? Well... It tells us a lot. It tells us that Tarshish could be reached by commercial vessel. Jonah didn't have to stow away. He didn't have to work his passage. He didn't have to sign up for an expedition. He just paid the fare and went. And this brings us to a harder question. What was the fare to Tarshish? And I think this is worthy of a few moments' consideration. Today, you can go far from next to nothing. There are many destinations you can reach from Liverpool Airport, where the flight will cost you less than the taxi fare from this meeting room to get there, to the airport. But it wasn't like that 2,800 years ago. There were fewer travellers then. We'll see just how few in a moment. Israel, particularly, had never been a great seafaring nation. I'm not sure why that is, given that its western boundary is completely defined by the sea and there's access to the Gulf at the southern extreme. Most of the transport was of goods, and we'll see this in a moment too. And of course, sea voyages took days, weeks even, and there would be quite a cost in catering and board to take a passenger. My guess is that in today's money, the fare was several thousand pounds, a sum that Jonah might have had to raise. It might have taken time. We should not think that Jonah ran away from God by sea on some sort of a whim. His escape, such as it was, took planning, effort and money. Jonah was determined not to go to Nineveh. And so he sails away westward. And I don't think they get very far before a huge storm puts the ship in danger of breaking up. And so the crew throw the cargo, valuable though it be, overboard because they value the lives of the passengers and themselves more than the cargo they're carrying. And this tells us that this was a mixed traffic vessel. Some of the huge cargo ships that ply the shipping lanes today still carry a small number of passengers. It's typically those who cannot bear to fly. And a small number of aircraft are configured for combined cargo and passenger operation. There is nothing new under the sun. Do you know where the best place to be is in a ship in a storm? It's in the innermost part of the ship. And that's where Jonah goes. And he sleeps. Jonah is still trying to escape from God. And the captain is not too impressed and finds him and he shouts at him, Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead. Well, well he really doesn't, doesn't quite say that. But it does make us think of Ephesians. And of course the words in Ephesians 5 are themselves a quote from the Old Testament. I have references to Isaiah and Malachi. Come on Jonah, time to get up, time to raise your game and help us by calling upon your God. Now my read of verses 6 and 7 is in fact that Jonah is the only passenger on, board, on the born board. I accept that this isn't conclusive. But reasonable, and it really does tell us that these long voyages were about trade, not tourism or cultural exchange. Now the mariners had already tried, verse 4, praying to their gods to assuage the storm. And this tells us another important fact that we're going to need in a moment, that the crew were Gentile. No surprises, praying to their gods had had no effect. And so they resort to another Gentile trick, random selection. They draw lots. Uh, by the way, my view of the lot casting for the replacement of Judas in the New Testament was that they cast votes. It wasn't random. And it wasn't random on this occasion either. For God caused the short straw or the double one to fall for Jonah. And Jonah knew it. And the crew say to him, what have you done? 
And why have you done it? And Jonah says, I am a Jew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land, and the Lord, the God of heaven, wanted me to go to a place I didn't want to go, and I ran from him. Woo, say the crew, your God is the God of heaven, earth and sea. Our gods only make thunder in a storm and help us make nice cakes with our tea on a Saturday afternoon. And frankly, our gods aren't even any good at that. But you fear the true God, the living God, the one God? Well, you can't hide from him. Where on the earth or the seas can you go? And Jonah is ashamed that it has taken Gentiles to make him see what he already knew. That you cannot escape. You cannot run away from the God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel. And so Jonah says, yes, I have made a terrible mistake. This is all my fault. Throw me over the side and the storm will subside. We need to pause there because these are very important words. We're in verse 12 of chapter 1. Jonah does not say, I'll go and throw myself over the side. Because he knows that to save this valiant crew, he's going to have to be sacrificed for them by them. Jonah the Israelite is going to have to die to save others, Gentiles no less. Hmm, I'm sure that should be reminding me of something. And the reaction of the crew to Jonah saying this tells us a great deal about the calibre of this crew. They weren't some sort of quasi-pirates. They were professional sailors, upholding the highest standards. The safety and comfort of their passengers was their primary concern. They had no hesitation heaving the valuable cargo over the side, but Jonah... He wasn't cargo and he wasn't going over. And so the men row even harder. One of the things I often see in the modern English translations is that when the translators really have oversimplified the word of God, the Lord moves them to write a footnote so we can see what is being really said. Because at the start of verse 13, my main text says, nevertheless, the men rowed hard. Well, I bet they did. But I have a footnote that says Hebrew, they dug in. Isn't that better? The crew were standing on their oars. They were putting everything they had into getting the ship out of danger. They were heaving at their oars. They were giving it their all. Because they thought, as so many still do today, that by their own efforts, they might achieve salvation for themselves and for Jonah. But they're wrong. The more they dig in, the more the Lord piles up the waves before them. And eventually, exhausted, they know that they, like Jonah, cannot deflect the living God from his purpose. But this crew are not only brave and honourable, they're fast learners too. For in verse 14, they are calling out to the Lord, the living God, and they use the memorial name notice. They're false gods forgotten. They're not coming back. Don't let us perish, they say. We will do as you ask and sacrifice this man that we might live. And so Jonah is hurled into the sea and the storm instantly abates. For God rewards their obedience to him in the instant that it takes him to think it. But the sailors do not forget the Lord after their deliverance. No, indeed, they've become like Jonah the Israelite. For they fear the Lord, verse 16, and they offer sacrifice and commit themselves to, it, to him. And it is here that we see what chapter 1 Indeed, the book of Jonah as a whole is all about. It's about salvation. In chapter 1, the crew of the ship are saved. They've become the most God-fearing sailors on the Mediterranean. And they will be telling their friends and families about the God of Israel and his prophet Jonah. And Jonah intended none of it. Yet simply by telling the sailors the truth of the living God, albeit in the teeth of a storm whipped up by the living God, it is like preaching the gospel. But Jonah, of course knows that words are not enough he has to make an example of himself and be sacrificed himself that the word might become real this is powerful stuff in the old testament looking towards the new for me however there's a little incompleteness in chapter one true the crew had followed exactly the instructions of god and with his divine certainty things had come about exactly as he had said through jonah but the crew was still ashamed that they had thrown jonah into the sea to drown I'm not, by the way, sure that the crew see Jonah being swallowed by the sea creature. But if they had, they would have assumed that Jonah was sea monster dinner. Either way, he was dead. But I like to think that God in some way managed to tell this crew, who are now his people, that he, the Lord, saved Jonah too. 
And at the start of chapter 3, I might just speculate on how this might have come about, but I shall be making this up completely, I'm afraid. Jonah chapter 2. Who is saved in chapter 2? This isn't a hard question. It's Jonah. And what is all this business with the sea creature? Well, it's all laid out clearly in verse 2. And my translation of uh, uh, Jonah 2 verse 2, well, let's pick it up at verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, Out of the belly of Shoal I cried, and you heard my voice. It's that word Shoal, the Hebrew word for grave. The sea creature is allegorical of the grave, the death of Jonah. So I don't really think you need to spend your time discussing whether the sea creature was a chordate, with the order Pisces, and whether it was the class Condicthes, that's the sharks and the rays. No bones, you know, in, in sharks or rays. Or whether it was the class Osteichthes, that's the bony fish, and there aren't really any of them big enough to eat a manhole. Or whether it was a mammal of the cetaceans, and don't tell me that all the large whales have baleen plates, which mean they can't swallow a man. Because all of that is missing the point. I think that this sea creature, whatever it was, was created by God for this purpose. Nothing is too hard for him. So whether it was a shark, or a whale, or the Loch Ness Monster on holiday, we need to think of it as Jonah's coffin, and he is in it. But Jonah isn't dead. Jonah is thinking, thinking hard. Jonah may not be dead, but in many respects he was as good as dead. And so he too prays to God. Jonah wasn't agnostic. He knew about God and he feared him. And Jonah didn't lack faith. But Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh. And in trying to run away from God, this is verse 4, Jonah had driven himself away from God. Not that God didn't know where Jonah was. But Jonah had excluded himself from the assemblies of God. He'd made himself as good as dead. And we're still in verse 4. Jonah is determined to see the temple once more. Because Jonah knows that God can raise him from his coffin. Because when it really mattered, Jonah had understood what God required of him. And Jonah brings his whole book together in verse 9 of chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. Where he says... But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And he says, he knows that it's about being thankful to God, who made us and gave us all that we have. It's about sacrifice. It's about commitment, by implication, trust and obedience to God. And it's about salvation. It's all about salvation. Just like chapter 1. Jonah demonstrates a lot of New Testament thinking here in the Old. And so my translation says that the whale vomited Jonah up on the shore on the dry land. I'm pretty certain that Jonah's seafaring days were over. And although it is an unfortunate word, through this Jonah is resurrected. He is reborn as a better servant of his God. And he's ready. Now, I need to take a little aside here, actually. I have so many asides, I'm not sure why I bother to pretend I have a central narrative thread. Where was the shore on which Jonah was deposited? I used to think it was on the shore of the Arabian Gulf, what is now Iraq, or maybe the creature even swam inland up the River Tigris to deposit Jonah good and close to Nineveh, so that he had no choice but to do what God required of him. And if that was the case, what a remarkable journey that was. The sea creature would have had to swim west all the way through the Mediterranean, through the Straits of Gibraltar, although they probably weren't called that, there, all the way down the coast of West Africa, round the Cape, all the way up East Africa, across the Gulf, and up the Tigris. There's no ship, even less submarine, that could do that in three weeks, never mind three days. It was indeed a miraculous journey. However, now that I've studied Jonah, I'm not sure I believe this anymore. I actually think that the sea creature deposited Jonah exactly where he set off, on the beach at Joppa. I'll explain why in just a minute. But maybe in the three days that Jonah had been in his seagoing coffin, the sailors had managed to limp their ship back to Joppa. And just maybe they saw Jonah walking up the beach, 
looking rather more determined than when they had last seen him. And maybe the crew give further thanks to God that he has extended his power to save even to Jonah and that he has extended his grace to them that they know that they did not drown someone. Although I have clearly made that up, so please put it on the apocryphal pile. Chapter 3. Who is saved here? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Because we need to look at verse 1 of chapter 3 first. Because verse 1 of chapter 3 is a rerun of verse 1 of chapter 1. And I think what has happened is that because Jonah has been saved, because he has been resurrected and reborn, the Lord God has set aside his mistake in chapter 1 and no longer recalls it. Jonah is back at home, just as he was at the start of chapter 1. And this is why the sea creature takes him back to Joppa. But this time, when the Lord calls Jonah, he's ready. He knows what's required of him, and he's going to do it. To understand a bit more about chapter 3, we need to look at the city of Nineveh. Nineveh isn't any old Bible city. It's a Genesis Bible city. And early Genesis is that. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, and we'll pick it up at ooh, verse 8. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginnings of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Calni in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Raboth Ur, Kala and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. As far as I can tell, Nineveh is the fifth city mentioned by name in the Bible. It's even before Ur. It is surely no mean city. And yet it isn't mentioned much in the Bible. There's a reference in two kings, which is repeated in Isaiah 37. There's the references in Jonah, then Nahum, one in Zephaniah, and the reference in the New Testament that we will be getting to eventually. And Nineveh doesn't get a great press in the Bible. It's worth noting that Nineveh is still a city today, but it's not at a good place, and you wouldn't want to go there. It's on the eastern bank of the river Tigris. On the opposite bank is the city of Mosul, and that one I'm thinking you have heard of. So what had Nineveh done to deserve destruction? Jonah doesn't tell us. It is simply enough that their evil had come before God and he had decided to destroy the city. The exact nature of the evil need not trouble us. But it would be nice to have some idea. And to get some idea, we need to look at our second minor prophet for today. The prophet Nahum. First, we need to note that Nahum was writing about a hundred years later than Jonah and once more Nineveh is worthy of destruction although again in Nahum although it is three chapters about the destruction of Nineveh it is not easy to discern what it is that Nineveh has done all we really have to go on is Nahum chapter 3 in the first four verses um, Nahum chapter 3 verse 1 Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey, the crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies, and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and people with her charms. Uh, Nahum, one feels, are uh, really going for it there. And the implication there is that Nineveh was particularly violent and repressive, although I'm not sure how literal this is, and in, in attacking its neighbours and robbing them. Perhaps it was the same 100 years earlier in Jonah's time. It's certainly hinted at in Jonah 3, um, verse 8, where we read, this is the king of Nineveh speaking, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. 
But it doesn't really matter what the Ninevites had done wrong. The Lord God had assessed it as evil and it was going to go. Jonah's job was to make it very clear to them why this was going to happen. And so having travelled overland, probably, Jonah arrives at Nineveh. It's a big city. There's a bit of debate about what the three days is all about. Is it the time it takes to walk around the city? Is it the time it takes to walk across it? Is it the time it takes to visit all the districts? Is there any parallel with the three days in the sea creature? Although this seems tenuous to me. And so Jonah starts. And he's got a message from God for Nineveh. And he's going to give it 100%. But just let's pause for a moment and imagine that Jonah's preaching campaign is going to be run like a 21st century business. What does success look like for Jonah? What are his key performance indicators? Who are the key opinion leaders? What's going to be his benefits realisation? Well, we can speculate what success might look like from reading Genesis 18. Um, It's a very strange conversation between Abraham and God on the number of righteous people um, that would be in Sodom for the Lord God to stay his hand and not destroy it. Um... Uh, Abraham chapter 18 verse 20 well if we pick it up at 26 and the Lord said if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city I will spare the whole place for their sake Abraham answered and said behold I have undertaken to speak to the Lord I who am but dust and ashes suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking will you destroy the whole city for lack of five and he said I will not destroy it if I find 45 there and it continues downwards until we get uh, to verse 32 Uh, where it's Abraham here, then Abraham said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak again, but this once, suppose ten are found there. And he answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. So um, we might think that having just to convince ten of the 120,000 citizens of Nineveh to give up being evil was a fair target. Actually, in business speak, we would call it a smart target. And with all forms of business speak, it's an acronym. Uh, No laughing, Uh, clever consultants have paid thousands of pounds to come up with this kind of stuff. But we can see that it is specific. People must be converted from evil to righteousness via repentance. It's measurable. There have to be at least ten people who repent. It is agreed. God tells us in Genesis 18 what has to be achieved. It's realistic. I mean, ten from 120,000? How hard can that be? And of course it is time-limited. Jonah has 40 days. And so with his project charter and Gantt chart in hand, Jonah sets off. Fortunately, Jonah has never been to business school, and so he just gets on with it. And he arrives in the first town squares, and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And he goes on to say why. To start with, Jonah isn't well received. He's either ignored or gets a bit of jeering. He's a bit like those folks who used to go around with sandwich boards saying the end of the world is nigh. But such was the clarity and the accuracy of the words that God had given Jonah to say and such was the fervour that the resurrected and reborn Jonah delivered them that something unexpected happened. After a few days Jonah started noticing people in the crowd that had a penitent attitude. They were wearing sackcloth and ashes. And when Jonah had said his bit, they would say, listen to him, and we've got to repent. And he easily exceeds his target of ten. And a few days later, there were politicians, judges, military leaders, contestants on reality TV shows, and other key opinion leaders saying the same thing. Indeed, before long, the news has reached the most important key opinion leader of all, the king. And the king doesn't lead opinions. He makes them. And he says, right, we are all going to repent. Even the animals are going to repent. Although it is interesting to note that when the king uh, refers to God, he doesn't use the memorial name, unlike the sailors earlier. And so the whole city of Nineveh repents. Everyone is saved. And so on day 41, Nineveh is still standing. And the Ninevites are genuinely relieved. You should not think that Jonah is angry, moving on to chapter 4, because he thinks that God has humiliated him. Because the Ninevites do not say to Jonah, you said the city would be destroyed and look here it is still. 
They were very genuinely repentant. Indeed, my read of the New Testament passage that we will eventually get to is that the repentance lasted at least one generation until the backsliding that we saw in Nahum. And so in chapter 3, it is the Ninevites, every single one of them, that are saved. Jonah, is he happy at the great work he has done? All the lives that he has saved? Well, it's clear that he was not. Indeed, he was very cross. Why is he so cross? Well, I've already said he wasn't cross because he'd saved an enemy of Israel. I've already said he wasn't cross because he thought God had made him look like a foolish false prophet. He could see how genuine the repentance of the Ninevites was. So why is he so cross? Jonah thought that he had got a deal with God. And the deal went was this. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and he went, well, it wasn't the second time of asking, but he did go. God told Jonah to proclaim to the Ninevites that they would be destroyed in 40 days. And Jonah had preached exactly that with great fervour. And God told Jonah that Nineveh would be destroyed. Or at least, that's what Jonah thought the Lord God had said to him. And Jonah thinks that this deal hasn't been kept. And he knows why. Jonah likes God to be the God of judgment. And he is, of course. Jonah likes God to be unswerving, unchanging, unbending. And he is, of course, all those things. And Jonah likes God to be the God of mercy and the God of grace. And the Lord God is, of course, merciful and gracious. Oh, but not too much, thinks Jonah. The balance here is wrong. Nineveh's evil made it worthy of destruction. It should have been destroyed. And so we have the little parable of the plant. Castor oil, by the way, according to the commentators, and there's much writing about this as well. The Lord gives Jonah shade, and the Lord takes it away, and Jonah is cross again. And God says to him, you pity a plant that you neither planted nor tended, how much more that the Lord God pity a whole city and the 120,000 people in it. I want to develop this a little further in a minute, but I think we should now finally get to the New Testament reference to Jonah, which we'll take from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, Something greater than Jonah is here. What was the sign of Jonah? Well, I had a look at what Harry Whittaker had to say. And his read of Jonah 2, 3 to 6 was that we should add these verses to mean that Jonah had really died and been resurrected. Though I'm not absolutely sure that that's necessarily the case. Although, of course, it could have happened. Nothing is impossible for God. Harry also thought that Jonah and the ship's crew meet again. I quite like it when I agree with our brother Harry. Um, and he had some views on that and he had a very long discussion about the three days and the three nights and it's very, little very literal interpretation by some that Jesus would be in the grave a full 72 hours but I think all of that discussion slightly misses the point what Jesus is showing is that he clearly understands that the great fish is an allegory of the death and the grave and that is what is going to happen to Jesus but he goes on to say, and this must have got the scribes and the Pharisees really cross, that they will be judged by the Gentiles of Nineveh that repented at the time of Jonah. And it is this remark, by the way, that suggests to me that the repentance of Nineveh was for at least one generation. If those who had repented at the word of Lord through Jonah had backslided during their own lifetimes, they would not be worthy to judge. It is, of course, sad that the Ninevites were not able to continue the repentance of Jonah and the righteousness it brought in their children and grandchildren. But this is, alas, what we see time and again in the Bible happen to God's own people 
But by making reference to Jonah, to the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus is saying much more. The scribes and the Pharisees would know that Jonah was a book that told about salvation. Salvation being brought to Gentiles. And Jesus was saying that his salvation was going to be available to the Gentiles too. And the scribes and the Pharisees would have known that the book of Jonah was all about sacrifice. It was all about commitment. It was all about salvation. And Jesus is saying that they don't have any and they aren't going to get any. Even though Jesus is much greater than Jonah. Jonah saved the crew of a ship and one city for one generation. Jesus was going to try and save the whole world forever. But would Jesus succeed in saving the whole world forever? Let's get back to Jonah chapter 4. I want to show you another metropolis. You might not recognise this. The big map is the little map in red. In the, in the, in the, and the big map, well that's Stockport. That's my town. Now, I don't know if it takes three days to walk round, but it'd take a while to walk the whole boundary. And the population at Stockport at the last sentence was 136,082, pretty close to the population of Nineveh. How successful has my proclamation of the gospel been in my town? Jonah had 40 days and he saved the whole city. We've been in Stockport 150 years and, well, we haven't. I suppose there are more than 10 of us, but we're not working with a huge amount of contingency anymore. And I guess that my assumption that only Christadelphians are righteous and that all Christadelphians are righteous is the kind of thinking that got Jonah into his difficulties in chapter 4. If when the kingdom is established and we are God willing welcomed in and we find the whole of Stockport there, will we be happy? Hmm, I suspect not. I think we might well complain like the workers in the vineyard. We've been toiling for you 150 years. This lot didn't even come to the Bible exhibition or carol service. Of course, we would like God's grace to extend to some of our friends and neighbours who, for whatever reason, didn't get round to getting baptised. But the whole metropolitan borough? And yet for us, I think this is the sign of Jonah. If we are to be as successful as Jonah, if we are to become more like Christ, then our attitude has to be that my whole town can be saved. My whole town will be saved. And we will do it. And we will keep doing it until the day that we see Jesus return. And perhaps the day we see Jonah, the crew of his ship, and the 120,000 Ninevites that he saved. <laughs>